Hi there, and welcome to Flip the Script Season 3, In the Weeds, Episode 16, The Three Types of Content You Can Use While Prospecting. My name is Beck. I'm the CEO and founder of Flip the Script, and I will be your guide for today's session. If you do me a favor, if you'd go to flipthescript.co first, on the left-hand side, click the tab Free Sales Training Hub, and then season three, and then episode 16, so you can download the deck. So it'll all be for free. All you have to do is put in your email to download the deck. And once you've done that, let's go ahead and jump into the content. So we're gonna have six different pieces to today's agenda. So the first, we're gonna cover the three types of content, the differences between first party, second party, and third party. Then we're gonna go into the types of content to avoid while prospecting. Number three, we're gonna go into the tips, uh, tips that you can use while you're using the content for prospecting. We're then gonna go into the benefits of using content in this manner, where to add it in a sequence, and then we're gonna finish off with a use cases that you can use content other than just prospecting. So why don't we start with the three types of content? So there are three types of content, essentially there's first party, second party, and third party. So first party is going to be, I am the arbiter of the information and I essentially am blitzing out content or, uh, dat or reviews based on my own data. So usually in this case scenario, we are going to have uh, somewhat trust issues with first party content. And the reason being, I as the vendor am guiding the narrative. So you see this a lot with uh, case studies, you know, that people don't necessarily inherit inherently trust them, or you see this a lot with um, uh, when someone gives references in the middle of an interview process, and the reason that they don't trust them is even if uh, this is someone that they worked with in the past, this is someone that they have essentially selected themselves. And so you're gonna see kind of a skewed agenda. So usually people will trust third party much more than they will first or second party because the person at hand, even if the third party, let's say review for instance, uh, it was a review, for instance, even though it's not necessarily an average or representative, um, you know, of the tool or software, it's going to be something that came from someone without an agenda. So in this type of content and first party content, the agenda would be to represent my product and or val uh, value prop in a positive light. So you'll see an inherent amount of mistrust behind this. So I did want to throw in the types of content that you can um, put out there, whether these be first party, second party or third party. But articles, podcasts, ebooks, book lists, webinars, any kind of insight based content of like, you know, the industry trend is that 25% of people who are requesting a demo actually get a, a first discovery call. And then you want to uh, compare them, uh, put them in comparatively. Influencer content and how to guides. But these are all the types of content that you can send. But the first type is going to be first party, which again is. I as the sender am the one that arbited the information together and I selected that out of my own data. So there's gonna be inherent perceived bias, if nothing else, in the outside, from the outside viewer. So they're gonna have a little bit less trust to it. Uh, the second type is second party content, uh, no pun intended. And this type of content, I am still the arbiter of the information, but it's someone else's data. So again, because there's some level of agenda behind there of how do I represent this data in a way that supports my use case, people won't trust it as much. And then the third party content, which is the most golden content to use, is something written by someone else. So this is gonna be the type of content that your buyer, uh, prospective buyers will trust the most because you weren't the author of the content at hand. So those are the three types of content that you can send and then some examples are within the deck. So number two, I wanted to go into the types of content I would avoid while I was prospecting. So the first type of content that I would avoid is essentially first party content, any content written by your company. And before all the product marketers absolutely murder me with the, uh, the hate mail, uh, hear me out for a second. Again, in the prospecting procl proclivity, this is someone that you haven't gotten a response from yet necessarily. Right, so in most cases you haven't gotten a response. So sending over content that's written by your company, there's an inherent perceived view that I shouldn't trust this content no matter what it was because someone's trying to sell me something. So the intent and the agenda matters. So oftentimes, regardless of the value of the content or how legitimate it is, there is a perceived uh, distrust, a mistrust in reading that content from the outside viewer. So I would avoid using content written by my company. Uh, second type I'd avoid is content about my company. So in the prospect 
prospecting phase, my primary agenda and primary goal is to add value. And what I mean by that is adding value to that person within their day-to-day -day role, whether that has something to do with me, my company or not. So usually what I'm trying to err towards is how do I add value to this person where I'm not the hero, I'm not the winner, and I'm not the ta-da of the, uh, the content, so to speak. So I'm really focusing on how do I add value when I'm not looking necessarily sending over something that makes me look good. So content that's about my, com that's about my company or written by my company, I would avoid. Content that is about my products, I would avoid. Case studies of my customers, I would avoid during the prospecting phase only. Very valuable in the sales cycle, but not in the prospecting phase, trying to get the first meeting. And then uh, content that's proving the validity of your company products or use case. So for instance, if I was selling video as a software, then not only would I not want to uh, send over content that's written by my company, but also not send over content that's talking about how video can make a big impression. Because again, your prospect, if the agenda is to sell them, they can feel it and they won't be able to read the content as effectively. So this is a great opportunity to highlight someone else and to add value in someone's day and homework that you're the kind of sales rep or SDR that's going to add value regardless of whether you are the winner of that, uh, of that process. So tips on using content while prospecting. Um, the first tip that I would have is I would tease out an excerpt. So if you wanna send over top 20 questions, for instance, the VP of sale, VPs of sales should be asking in 2022, for instance, I would tease out an excerpt for my prospects so that they have something that's digestible. So I especially liked question number three. You know, for instance, you'd say, I, I saw this article the other day that I thought that you might like. It's on the top 20 questions that VPs of sales should be asking within 2022. I especially thought you liked question number three on what time of day are my SDRs prospecting? Uh, number two, my second tip would be make the excerpt short. You know, so in everything, brevity, uh, I'm always going to glean to or uh, uh, cling on to the clip. Uh, never use seven words when four words will do from Ocean's Eleven. So I'd make the excerpt short so that your prospect can read it and it's very digestible for them. Uh, number three, the content should have low lift for the prospect. So I would uh, encourage you to send over something that doesn't have a lot of gates, doesn't have a lot of times they have to put in their email. Sometimes I'll look at content, it'll be great, but I'm hit by a lot of paid ads and things that are blocking the content. So I, I try to uh, make sure there's low lift to your prospect to enjoy it. Uh, number four, more segmented, the better. So what I mean by that is even though I love articles on lengthy debate on, you know, let's say uh, the value of a clean diet versus, you know, a raw food diet, you know, for instance, versus the top five foods that I should avoid eating to lose 20 pounds in the next month, I'm going to err towards the latter. So uh, general humanity is going to err towards the latter. The top 20, the top seven, three things to say that will turn your prospect around you know, but the more segmented and clickbaity-ish, I would say, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it is going to be more attractive to the reader. So I would try to optimize for the articles that really add value, along with the ones who have segmented it for your user in a very digestible fashion. Um, number five, I'd cater, uh, cater the content towards buyer persona. So that will help you avoid product-centric ca uh, content is something that's valuable to that buyer persona in specific. Uh, the prospect shouldn't require a piece of tech to deploy the content or any kind of piece of anything. So a great example of uh, how this is done is I watch a lot of Food Network to kind of decompress for my day. And a lot of times whenever they are uh, presenting some type of recipe, they'll give an option of here's a packet of, you know, the pre-ingredients that are packed, etc. But if you want to do this longhand and you want to do this according to, you know, to whatever ingredients you have, here are the measured ingredients that you need to include. So it's obviously harder to do it that way. Here's an easier option. But you always want to give your prospect a a uh, piece of content that they can deploy that does not require a piece of tech for them to do it. And then also the last tip here would be the concept should be a uh, concept or the, of the content should be immediately deployable. So let's go into the benefits of adding content in this manner. So the first benefit <clears throat> that's a major benefit is when you send over content that's not about your company and it's not about you being awesome and the ta-da isn't that you're great or the ta-da isn't that they should buy your product or there is no CTA that they should buy your product and it is adding value to them inherently, 
you interrupt the pattern of a thing that a normal seller would do. So they're used to a pattern, a, a sales rep who does all of the former. Trust me, every single time I'm training a team, I train on this concept and I come back to the worksheets and about 85% of the time, it's going to be product related content because their bend is I should only talk well about myself, only talk well about myself. But when you talk about someone else and you highlight someone else, it gives a very valuable pattern interrupt to their normal view pattern of a seller. So it, 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 it can interrupt that pattern that you are a seller and you are only the kind of person that adds value whenever there's something in it for you, but you are instead someone who adds value whenever there's something in it for them. Uh, the second type of benefit is you make some level of deposit. So I would view our prospects, so to speak, in sort of a bank account way. I need to make a certain amount of deposits with them. I need to make a certain amount of valuable item ads here so that when I ask for a withdrawal, like asking for 15 or 30 minutes of their time, you know, or an intro to someone else, whatever the deposit is, or sorry, withdrawal is, that I have a fair enough de uh, deposit bank account here. So I would view my prospects in the same way that every single time that I add value, it's like making a deposit to uh, their system. Uh, number three, they see you as someone, when you do this in this manner specifically, who adds value even when there's nothing in it for you. So people are watching. They are watching everything you do, don't do, say, don't say, communicate something. <laughs> Trust me, it communicates something. Everything you do, don't do, say, don't say, communicate something. So when you add value multiple times and you highlight another writer, for instance, and this is valuable to them but had no benefit to you necessarily, they will take notice of that situation. So it paints you in a very positive light as someone that almost like Pavlov's dogs, when they see you, they know they're going to get value and so they show up accordingly. Uh, number four, you are highlighting someone else's work, a very positive thing to do. So typically the general rule of thumb is if you talk poorly about someone else, what Sarah says about Sally says more about Sarah than Sally. So if I talk poorly about someone else, I look negative and maybe the second person. And if I talk positively about someone else, we both look good. So this gives you a great opportunity. I love it when I come across good writers, good sellers, et cetera, and I can talk well about them on social media, you know, cause it gives me a chance to highlight someone else. And then you're viewed in the light of, of you find value in the work of others around you. So this is actually a characteristic of a highly mature person as well is that they will find value and talk about the value in others around them. Uh, and then you're uh, talking about someone else that uh, actually shows character. So it's kind of in tandem with point number four, but both of these put you in a very positive light to the person you're prospecting into. So I want to go into where to add this into a sequence next. So this is the sequence that I uh, recommend using. And again, you can see in the deck all the different steps here. But essentially, I have uh, 16 steps over 21 business days within my sequence. And the great places to add value, um, I send five emails in total, 10 calls, two voicemails along the way, and it gets more aggressive near the back end. If you want to see more, if you go into personalization point, I believe I go into the entire breadth of the sequence. But a great place to add value would be uh, email two. So this is a reply email to email one. Email one, I use a personalized premise. And email two is a reply email that says any thoughts, and I say P.S., you know, I thought you might like this article on X, Y, and Z. Uh, the second great place to add value, and I put these both in red, is the breakup email. So how you break up with someone or how you end a business relationship is more important oftentimes than how you start one. So this is where you're going to see someone's true character is in a breakup when they are not getting what they want. So this is a great, I actually love breakup emails. I think they're one of the most valuable times because this is a place where people usually hallmark their worst traits as a prospector. And it's your opportunity to hallmark your best traits as a prospector. So usually I'll see people send some type of email like, you know, hey, reason I tried calling you five or 10 times, but you didn't pick up, you know, kind of putting accountability and the guilt on them as the prospect. 
they'll say uh, something like, you must not be the right decision maker. You know, is there someone who is? Meaning they're kind of insulting the prospect to the face. Or they'll say something like, you must be off on an island somewhere or not value data or not want to support your team in that manner, also insulting. And then they try and somehow pitch again. They're like, how's Tuesday at two to meet? So it's not truly a breakup email. So breakup emails are going to be my favorite type of email because you can hallmark your best traits, one of which, even when I'm breaking up with someone, meaning I'm, I'm saying something to the degree of, you know, reason for my outreach is I just want to, you know, send a, a one last note to make sure I didn't overstep my bounds. You know, when we originally chatted or, you know, when I originally saw your article, I thought it'd be a great time to reach out. Maybe it's me, but I'm getting the feeling that right now the call doesn't make sense. And uh, I, you uh, just don't want to know how to let me down easily. You know, you like you're super polite or it's, you do, uh, don't want to let me down easily. And I'm the annoying sales rep who can't take a hint. You know, I'm going to leave you alone now. But if I can be of any help with anything, you know, now and in the, or in the meantime, just let me know. You know, and perhaps one day we'll uh, meet in the future. P.S. I thought you might like this article on blank, especially point number blank you know, on covering X, Y, and Z, take care and then sign it. So what you're doing here is essentially taking up the sting that they're a bad person for not responding by saying it makes complete sense why you didn't respond. I'm the annoying one who can't take a hint. I want to make sure that I didn't mess up here. Let's just meet down the road. You're signing off, but before you do, you're giving them a piece of value. So even when you're walking out the door, you want to give some piece of value to the person that's right in front of you. So it's very high character. Uh, so where to include that is email. You can do two, four, and five. I would say if you're going to do product-led content, I would do it with the pattern interrupt. I would say something to, to the degree of in the PS, you could say, if I'm being too pushy and you want to check this out, but don't want me involved, I get it. Here's a one pager on X, Y, and Z. But email two, I do third-party content. Email five, I do third-party content. And I try to make it a different medium. If you did like an article in two, then I do a video in five. And then for four, uh, if you wanna do product related content, this is where I would do it if you're going to do it. Uh, so I'm gonna go into some other cases uh, with, that you can include content other than outbound prospecting and then we'll close out. So uh, when someone switches roles, that's a, gr a great place to include content. So specifically if this was someone who used your product in the past and then went on to another company, this is a great way to send content on onboarding, et cetera, so that you're making deposits because potentially they could want to buy you again, but this is a sweet way to have that introduction. Uh, expansion selling, you know, if you're coming up on renewal or prior to an upsell or cross sell situation, if you wanna send over content, this is a great way to keep in front of your buyer and add value in front of your buyer, but not have to send in the annoying checkup emails. Uh, when someone ghosts you or goes dark on you, this is a great way to get back in front of them. So every time someone like, you know, starts to go a little bit dark and I need some type of decision, instead of saying just checking in or following up or any update on this, I will send a piece of content. And I actually, I have a marquee deal in my head that I close this way. And I sent over a piece of content when I needed a uh, some level of decision and this person knew it at the time. And when I was training his team on this, he said, this actually works. I said, what do you mean by that? Let's call him Ben. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, when you sent me that content, I thought, man, she's a valuable asset in my corner. And I said, let me ask you a question, Ben. Let's say his name's Ben. Ben, let me ask you a question. Did you know what I needed at the time? He goes, absolutely. But it was a sweet way you know, of getting a gentle reminder that you needed that thing from me, even though you didn't say it. And it was a great way to... Um, essentially put yourself that you're a valuable person right in front of me, even when I hadn't given you something. So they'll know what you need at that point, And it's a high value way to get back in front of them. And then the last way you can use it is no show prevention. So no shows are very high in the industry, meaning they scheduled a meeting and then they don't show up to the initial meeting. So I'd say no show prevention rates for uh, with specifically cold calls is going to be higher than email, but they're going to hover around 35% that agree to an email or agree to a first discovery meeting and then don't actually show up. So once they agree to the meeting, especially if it's far out in terms of the tenure, you know, from the, uh, the um, date when you scheduled it to the date 
it's supposed to occur, or you feel like it's a high risk situation, then I would send over content between then and the meeting to start investing and making deposits along the way so that it increases the person's likelihood that they will buy in and show up to the meeting in the future. So in summary, content can be a really, really fun way to add value to your prospects as long as it's specific to them you know, and doesn't focus on us. So content is a vehicle that we can add value along every single step of the way for our prospect. So they view us as someone who's consistently adding value and they want to continue the relationship because of it. So that is everything. That's all the content that we have for today. If you like this session, you want to hear more just like this. If you go to flipthescript.co and we have a bunch of different sessions on anything and everything sales. And if you really like this content and you want to give us some feedback, if you go to flip the script on LinkedIn, tag me and flip the script and let us know what you thought and what you want to hear more of. But either way, I hope you have a great rest of your day and thank you for tuning in. Watch out.